My name is Jeremy Krause, lead teaching pastor here at Mill Creek Community Church. Thank you for joining us for our online worship service. If you like what you see or would like more information, please visit us at mymillcreek.com. I'm Ricky Dawson. I lead worship and the caring ministry here at Mill Creek. And we are so thankful that you've chosen to join us uh, worshiping the Lord, even though it's an on online environment. Uh, and we are praying that the Lord would protect you and your family during this health crisis. With that in mind, let's begin. Good morning, wherever you are, wherever you're watching. Welcome to worship here at Mill Creek Online. Hear the word of the Lord from Psalm 96. It reads, oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. And we can take these actions whether we're gathered together or whether we're scattered abroad. Let's sing to the Lord these songs. Amen. With his heart open wide from the depths, from the heights, I will bring a sacrifice. With these hands lifted high, hear my song, hear my cry, I will bring a sacrifice. I will bring a sacrifice. I lay me down, I'm not my own. I belong to you alone. Lay me down, lay me down. Oh, and on my heart this much is true. There's no life of Take this light and let it shine, shine, shine. Take this light and let it shine. I lay me down, I'm not my own. I belong to you alone. Lay me Let's put our hands together in our living rooms, wherever we are. Lift this phrase. It would be my joy to say your will, your way. It would be my joy to say your will, your way. It would be my joy to say your will. Let's sing that together again. It 
would be my joy to say your will your way it would be my joy to say your will your way it would be my joy to say your will your way always i lay me down i'm not my own i belong to you alone lay me down lay me down oh and on my heart this much is true there's no life apart from you lay me down lay me down oh lay me down lay me down to you therefore brothers by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable for God which is your spiritual worship amen but ask the animals and they will teach you or the birds and the sky and they will tell you or speak to the earth and it will teach you or let the fish in the sea inform you which of all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has created us all creatures of our God and King lift up your voice and with us sing oh praise him hallelujah thou burning sun with golden beam thou silver moon with softer gleam oh praise him oh praise him hallelujah 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 things their creator bless and worship him in humbleness oh praise him hallelujah praise praise the father praise the son and praise the spirit three in one oh praise him oh praise him by his blood come and rejoice in his great love oh praise him hallelujah christ has defeated every sin cast all your burdens now on him oh praise him oh Turn in power to reign. Heaven and earth will join to say, Oh, praise him. Hallelujah. And who shall fall on Holiness. 
Amen. He is worthy of our worship.
Hello, friends. My name is David, and one of the pastors here. This morning's scripture reading is Acts chapter 28, verses 1 through 10, and I'll be reading from the ESV, the English Standard Version. If you have your Bibles with you, I'd encourage you to go ahead and turn there to Acts chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. Follow along with me as I read. After we were brought safely through, we then learned that the island was called Malta. And the native people showed us unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and welcomed us all, because it had begun to rain and was cold. When Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and put them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. And when the native people saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, No doubt this man is a murderer. Though he has escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. He, however, shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. They were waiting for him to swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But when they had waited a long time and saw no misfortune come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. Now in the neighborhood of that place were lands belonging to the chief man of the island named Publius, who received us and entertained us hospitably for three days. It happened that the father of Publius lay sick with fever and dysentery. And Paul visited him and prayed, and putting his hands on him, healed him. And when this had taken place, the rest of the people on the island, who had diseases also, came and were cured. They also honored us greatly. And when we were about to sail, they put on board whatever we needed. Would you please join me in prayer before this morning's teaching? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the gift of your scripture. We thank you even for this sort of strange story about a snake and fire and dysentery. And so, Jesus, we pray that you would be with Jeremy now as he teaches, as he brings us today's lesson from this passage. And would you help us all to be able to understand what you're saying? And may we be called to action to follow you and love you more this day and every day to come. We pray this in your name, dear Jesus. Amen. There I was, a nine-year-old, with my Bible open, trying to pray. I'd been taught at a young age, these are good habits to begin. Spend a few moments in the Word, spend a few moments praying. And as a nine-year-old, somewhere I got my wires crossed because I began to draw the conclusion that if I was able to repeat these habits every day, somehow God would bless me for my obedience. There as a nine-year-old, I had a favorite football team and I wanted so desperately for my football team to win that I began to think, oh, if I would just obey the Lord, why then he would be so happy to help my football team win. Imagine my surprise there in 1989 when my poor Broncos went five and 11. I was so confused. Was I reading the wrong part of the Bible? Was I not praying right? Lord, please. Have you ever bought into this cause and effect kind of thinking? My seminary professor used to call it magical thinking. You could call it karma. It's this idea that your previous decisions influence the future. It's a sort of thinking that leads you to conclude that when something good happens, the reason something good happens is because you did something good previously, or vice versa. If something bad happens, it's because, if you wind back the clock, you did something bad. Karma, if you didn't know, is part of two different world religions, Buddhism and Hinduism. And Both world religions buy into this idea that our destiny is determined by our previous decisions. And karma-like thinking can lead Christians to conclude that if they got a raise in their job, why, it's because they were obedient. Or if a Christian got a flat tire, 
Well, that's because they miss their quiet time too many days. And while it's goofy in hindsight to think that as a nine-year-old, my quiet time could somehow influence whether my favorite team won a game or lost a game, this sort of karma-like thinking can influence us in ways we don't even expect. It can show up even with parenting. See, parents can buy into this formula-like thinking, cause and effect thinking, when they consider that if they do all the right things, their kids will grow up to love Jesus. Parents, any of you ever struggled with karma-like parenting? That if you just follow the formula, your kids love Christ. But of course, the challenge is that if your kids decide not to follow Christ, your temptation is to look inward and to consider, what did I do wrong? What part of the formula am I not following? Are my kids rejecting Christ because of some disobedience in my own life? Well, this morning, we come to a text in which God is going to confront some folks on an island who hold to this religious belief that there is a cause and effect relationship in the world. You could say these people on the island of Malta believe in karma, and God is going to confront their karma-like belief in an effort to show them the truth of Jesus Christ. It's going to give us an opportunity then to evaluate our own tendency toward this false religious system. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you have your Bibles, would you please open to Acts 28 verses 1 to 10. We've got one big idea from the text today. It's a question. Do you believe in karma? For those of you who have the link to our handout, I encourage you to grab that handout and print it off. Kids, we've created one especially for you. If you don't have one, ask your parents to push pause and print it off for you real quick. Let's jump into our big idea today. Do you believe in karma? Let me read first couple verses there, Acts 28. Look with me, Acts 28, verse 1. Luke writes, After we were brought safely through, we then learned that the island was called Malta. The native people showed us unusual kindness for they kindled the fire and welcomed us all because it had begun to rain and was cold. When Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and put them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. Now, if you've missed previous episodes in the book of Acts, we're here near the very end of our book and we've seen Paul come face to face with death in like five different ways. Way back in Acts chapter 22, there's this mob that nearly kills him. And then Acts 23, there's this religious council that nearly kills him. Later on, there's this mob of 40 crazy folks who take an oath to not eat or drink till they kill Paul. That's a third brush with death. In Acts 27, there's a shipwreck that nearly kills Paul. And as if that's not enough, some soldiers nearly kill him. There at the end of Acts, verse 42. And now in our text, what we see is it's nighttime on this beach. Kids, get it in your mind. The rain is still coming down. This terrible hurricane with 100 mile an hour winds is still pummeling the shore. And the crew and all on the boat that was shipwrecked have finally made it to shore. They're sopping wet. They're cold. They're tired. And as they're sitting there on the shore, somebody has made a fire to begin to warm themselves, to warm others. And where's Paul? Hiding out under some shelter? Drying off next to the fire? Not at all. Look at Paul. He's out gathering wood so that that fire doesn't die out. But out of nowhere, a viper bites Paul. A viper, venomous snake. It's poisonous. It will kill you. If you get bit by a viper, you're dead. It gets Paul for when the native people saw the creature, the snake, hanging from Paul's hand, 
kids, do you get this in your mind? <laughs> He's holding some sticks, and then a viper gets him, and it's just hanging there. The native people said to one another, no doubt this man is a murderer. Though he has escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. Now talk about out of the frying pan and into the fire. Poor Paul, who's had all these recent brushes with death, is now been bit by a poisonous snake. You've got to be kidding me. For somebody who believes in karma, Paul must have really missed a lot of quiet times to have such bad luck, don't you think? But if you look closely at the word justice in your text, you might notice that in the ESV translation, the letter J on justice is capitalized. And here's why they did that. In Greek mythology, there on the island were folks who believed in the Greek goddess, DK. DK, daughter of Zeus, and her job was to bring justice in this cause and effect sort of way, in a karma-like way. And so what all these folks on the island, when they observe Paul having just survived the shipwreck, getting bit by a poisonous snake, they all say, wow, that guy has finally got what he deserves. He's getting justice. But look what happens next. Five. Paul, however, shook off the creature into the fire. See that in your imagination? Snake on his hand. He just shakes it off right into the fire. Suffered no harm. Verse six. And they, the islanders, were waiting for Paul to swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But when they had waited a long time and saw no misfortune come to Paul, they changed their minds. Said Paul was a god. Now I think if we could see our author Luke writing this part, there'd be a twinkle in his eye because of the comedic twist. These islanders, so committed to their religious system, this karma-like thinking, that once Paul survives the snake bite, they decide, well, he must be a god, just like DK's a goddess. He must be equivalent in power. But what Luke's showing us is, God allows Paul to be bitten by this poisonous snake in an effort to confront the re religious system of these islanders. For since their karma-like religious system is wrong, God allows Paul's unfortunate snake bite to show them karma's wrong, even if they weren't drawing that conclusion on their own. The first six verses then lead us to the conclusion that it is God who heals Paul. I'd love for you to write that down. God heals Paul. Karma's wrong. God heals Paul. But do you believe in karma? Or do you believe in the one true God? And that's the question that this text has drawn us to consider because while karma is a popular option for some of our friends and neighbors out there, karma is also a tempting option for folks who profess to be Christians. Our temptation is to buy into formula religion that if we do these sorts of actions, causes, there will be this effect. Do you believe in formula religion? Do you believe in karma? We're not Hindus. We're not Buddhists. We're Christian. Look with me at verses 7 to 10 before we consider application 7. Now, in the neighborhood that, of that place were lands belonging to the chief man of the island named Publius, who received us and entertained us hospitably for three days. It happened that the father of Publius lay sick with fever and dysentery. Okay, get this in your minds. It's been three days since the snake bite. And you've got all these people who were coming on shore after the shipwreck. Luke tells us it's 276 folks who have no food, they have no shelter, they have no extra clothes. They just had survived. And now what are they going to do? Well, there's this nice guy. He's the chief man of the island, Publius. He's like the mayor. And he's hospitable. He welcomes them. And as he's there, 
Paul comes to find out that his dad has dysentery. All right, dysentery. You do not want to Google dysentery. Don't look at the symptoms. You can't unsee that stuff. Dysentery is when your intestines are inflamed, okay? Swollen tummy, kids. What is more, if you have dysentery, it makes you have to hustle when it's time to go potty, if you know what I mean. You know what I mean. (laughs) Dysentery, if you're familiar with the game Oregon Trail, it can be deadly. It's nasty. And in view of the cause and effect religious beliefs on that island, in view of karma-like thinking, contextually, we're on solid footing to conclude that many of the folks, including Publius, the mayor, probably thought that this man suffering with dysentery must have done something awful. And kids, you can probably imagine how awful in your behavior must you be to struggle with the Hershey squirts all the time. Can I say that? I mean, this grandpa of a man must have done something horrible to have diarrhea consistently. Middle of verse 8, look what happens. And Paul visited him and prayed and then put his hands on this man healing him. Oh man, I love the Bible. I love this story. You could not make this stuff up. Kids, if people ever ever tell you that the Bible is boring, would you please take them to Acts 28 verse 8 where the man with diarrhea gets healed? I mean, God is powerful to heal. How cool is that? God's powerful to heal a poisonous viper bite. God's powerful to heal a man from dysentery, but that's not all. Look at verse 9. And when this healing had taken place, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases also came out and were cured. I mean, sounds to me like a healing revival. Sounds to me like something you might see on the Benny Hinn TV channel, except this is legit healing. You get healed. You get healed. All y'all get healed. God heals the sick. That's what Luke's showing us. I'd love for you to write that down. God heals the sick. Verse 10. And all the islanders also honored us greatly. And when we were about to set sail, they put on board whatever we needed. I learned in studying for this passage that when you got on a boat to travel to a destination, you had to bring your food, provisions, extra clothes, whatever you needed to make it there. This was not like a cross-country flight where a flight attendant would give you a few pretzels and a drink with some ice cubes in it. And of course, everybody who was shipwrecked lost all of their possessions. And so here these islanders, they're so hospitable to say, hey, whatever you need to get to Rome, let us provide it for you. They're by setting them up for a successful last leg to their final destination, the city of Rome. Now, Buddhists or Hindus might come to the end of this section and they may think to themselves, Well, this makes sense, man. Look, the mayor was nice to Paul and everybody by giving him a place to stay. And and then in a karma-like response, Paul was nice to heal everybody on the island. And then in a karma-like response, all the islanders were very hospitable to provide for the provisions for those on the ship. But... But that's not what Luke's showing us. There's not this cause and effect relationship that Luke's trying to highlight. Rather, what Luke's showing us is that these healings and these provisions, they're not the result of formula-like living. Rather, it's a demonstration of God's power to heal and God's power to provide. I'd love you to write that down. It's God who provided for the passengers leads us back to the dominant question we've been considering here in the text. What do you believe? 
Do you believe in karma? Or do you believe in the one true God? What do you believe? For of course, our tendency, your tendency, my tendency, it's to try to make sense in these crummy situations and to wonder is the reason that we're having such a hard go of it because I did something wrong. Did I not do quiet time the right way? Is this punishment for some egregious sin? And conversely, when something goes well, our tendency is to think, oh, there it is. There's God finally rewarding me for my formula obedience. But the point of this entire section is, karma is not in control. God is. Friends, God is in control, not karma. I'd love for you to write that down. That's the sermon in a sentence. God is in control, not karma. God was in control in the shipwreck. God was in control in the viper bite. God was in control when he healed the man with dysentery. God was in control when all the diseased on the island were healed. And God was in control when they had provisions sent with them on the ship. God is always in control. Mm, get some. Now let me press this into our lives, some personal application. Three applications for you to consider. First is this, believe in God's justice. Would you write that down? Believe in God's justice. See, there might be some who struggle with karma and might read this sort of a text and think to themselves, yeah, you know, I guess I do kind of believe in karma because every time I read this, I just think, this is not fair. Man, it's not fair that Paul was unjustly imprisoned. It's not fair that he didn't get the right trial. It's not fair that he had all these brushes with death. It's not fair that he was almost killed when he was shipwrecked. It's just not fair that he was out trying to do something good and he got bit by a viper. It's just not fair. But for those who are struggling to reconcile God's justice with Paul's life, what you must understand is, as far as Paul's concerned, Whatever God has him go through is quite fair. Thank you very much. To say it differently, Paul did not shake his fist at God and say, how dare you? This isn't fair. Because Paul knew in God's justice what Paul deserved. Paul understood it. He wrote it in a letter. We have it in Ephesians 2 where Paul wrote, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you've been saved. See, Paul understood what justice demanded. Paul understood what his sinful life had earned him. Paul understood the consequences of the wages of sin, and it was death. So Paul wasn't sitting around complaining, thinking to himself, it's not fair, because Paul knew that it was only because of God's mercy and grace that he had been saved. And this is why this is important for you and I today. This is why it's important to believe in God's justice. Far too many of us say that we believe the gospel. Too many of us say, oh yeah, 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 I believe in Jesus, but then we functionally walk around in the fog of believing in karma. See, Christian, you have to understand, if you've believed the gospel, then justice has been paid for you. You need to understand this, that justice, true justice, eternal justice, God's perfect justice for Christians was paid there at the cross. There at the cross, when Jesus died, he satisfied the wrath of God. And God, we had this cup of wrath, is one of the pictures the Bible gives us, and God poured that cup of wrath out on Jesus completely. Justice has been satisfied for you, Christian. Believe it. It's not like God left a little bit of wrath at the bottom of the cup for when you and I mess up. 
It's not like God was looking at nine-year-old Jeremy who had so many sinful problems and probably never read his Bible or prayed the right way and then said, ah, you're kind of messing up. Here's a little bit of wrath for you. God's not looking at you when you make mistakes. Oh, here's a little bit of wrath I'm gonna pour out on you. Oh, parents, you didn't do it just right. Here's a little bit of punishment for you. That's not how God works. God's wrath was satisfied on Jesus at the cross. Believe it, Christian. There is no wrath left for you. Since God's justice has been satisfied then. Whatever circumstances you and I are going through, it's not punishment. It's not justice. Don't walk in the fog of this Christian karma hybrid. Believe in God's justice. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, but wait, Okay, I I wanna believe in God's justice, but Jeremy, how do I reconcile when it feels like God punishes David in the Old Testament? Or how do I reconcile these Hebrews 12 passage where God disciplines his children? And while I don't wanna derail the sermon and take a rabbit trail into a place where our text doesn't lead, perhaps you'll find this helpful. There is a categorical difference between God disciplining his children and God punishing us in his wrath. Those are categorical differences. So while our mistakes will have natural consequences and while Christians may receive some of discipline from God, understand that in God's perfect justice, we are not punished by God and receiving his wrath for our sin that has been satisfied at the cross. Believe it. Application two, share Jesus everywhere. This whole book of Acts tells the story of how God has taken ordinary people just like you, just like me. Just ordinary people. And he's, he's brought them together, united them, and then through the Holy Spirit, empowered them to share Jesus everywhere. So the whole book of Acts is about, in three words, sharing Jesus everywhere. And throughout Acts, we've seen Paul so confident. He appears to have no wiggle in his step as he's on a boat that's going to be shipwrecked and as he's getting bit by a viper it's like he doesn't even flinch Paul's so confident in the promises of God and he seems to leverage nearly every opportunity to share Jesus and while in this small section we've looked at today does not have an explicit gospel reference we're on strong footing contextually that Certainly, as commentators agree, Paul and Luke must have shared Jesus during the three months they stayed on that island. But the place where I most profoundly see the connection for this application is not just a contextual argument, it's also a consequence, a logical consequence of application one. Here's what I mean. If you believe in God's justice and you're a Christian, and you know that the wrath of God has been satisfied, and God's not mad at you, and God's not punishing you for your sin. This is not only a glorious thought for us as Christians, but it's a sobering thought in view of our neighbors and friends and family members who don't know Christ. See, friends, when you realize that God's justice remains for those who are not in Christ, it should motivate you to want to share Jesus everywhere. Because these precious people, maybe they believe in karma, maybe they believe in some other false religion, whatever they believe in, they are staring down the barrel of God's infinite justice. And we want to share with them and warn them, God's justice is coming for you, for God will have eternal justice with them as well. For God's wrath against Christians was satisfied at the cross. God's wrath 
for non-Christians will be satisfied in eternity. The Bible's clear. Eternal conscious punishment for those who don't trust in Christ and that should motivate us to share Jesus. You gotta understand that our friends and neighbors who don't know Christ, they're in worse shape than all those islanders who were sick with diseases. They're in worse shape than that grandpa who had dysentery. They're in worse shape than, than Paul who got bit by a, by a viper. They're in worse shape than all of the shipwreck. They're in worse shape than they realized. So we must go tell them, tell them about Christ. Share Jesus everywhere. You might be thinking, look, pastor, how am I supposed to do that? Like, how am I going to tell them about Christ? Well, the theme of this entire text has been to share Jesus everywhere. Excuse me. The theme of this entire text has been the theme of justice. And it should motivate us to share Jesus everywhere and use this theme of justice to communicate with our neighbors. What I'm trying to say is our neighbors are longing for justice. Just look at any of the popular movies that are coming out. Justice is such a dominant theme. Look at the political talking points. Justice seems to always be brought up. It's one of the common graces in our culture today. Our friends and neighbors, they long for justice. We're also tired of hearing about these victims who are hurt, these little ones who are abused. We're so tired of having to try to reconcile how the evil seem to continue and all of these vulnerable are being oppressed and in a culture that's longing for justice, Christian, we have the answer. Justice is coming. His name is Jesus and one day he will rule in perfect justice over all and as we await that day, Christian, share today the message of salvation and how our friends and neighbors can find justice in Christ. Final application Remember God's power to heal. Kids, if you're still with us, you've done a great job. I promise I'm almost done. Here's the last application. Write it down. Remember God's healing power from our text. God's powerful over viper bites. God's powerful over dysentery. God's powerful over all the diseases on the island. God's powerful to provide provisions for these folks headed to Rome. God's powerful in his justice. God's powerful to help you share Jesus everywhere. God's powerful to heal. We see it throughout our text, and I want you to know that. I want you to believe that. But not only do we see that in our text, we see it in the most powerful moment in all of scripture. The most crucial moment in all the Bible when Jesus Christ was out serving us, living perfectly. When Jesus Christ was bitten by this deadly viper, Satan, there on the cross. And Jesus hung on the cross and Jesus died. And the crowd all thought justice had been served as they put Jesus in the tomb. And then three days later, Jesus was resurrected. God's power to heal was seen in the person and work of Jesus Christ as no viper bite could keep him down. And while the crowd was wrong on the island to think Paul was a God, give me a break, that's a joke. Everyone was right to know that upon Jesus' resurrection, he was God. And today, Jesus, he still powerfully reigns Jesus powerfully reigns over all creation, powerfully reigns over life and death. Jesus powerfully reigns over all the world. And one day, Jesus is returning to bring perfect justice to all of us, perfect healing. It hasn't happened yet. And despite the threat of the coronavirus all around us, it may be hard to believe, but one day, perfect healing, Eternal healing will take place. Justice is coming. The empty tomb assures us of God's power to heal. And with God's healing in mind, we can be assured that God's powerful to heal us. And personally, 
I see it in your life. I'm so glad you've joined us for this online worship service, but it's a far substitute from getting to see you in person, look you in the eye, let you know how much I must, I miss and love you. But in these moments when we're practicing this social isolation and we're not together, I'm reminded of how God's healing you. And I see it in some of your lives. I'm looking at you who have blessed friends. Some of you have shared with me the name of the person you're praying for. And I see God changing your heart as you continue to persevere in prayer. And no, you may struggle to believe that God can save them, though in your heart of hearts you've acknowledged it seems so impossible or improbable. Nevertheless, you are persevering to pray and listen and serve these neighbors. And I see God changing you. He's healing you. Believe the powerful gospel and believe he can heal your blessed friend. And I'm thinking about those of you who are struggling with personal sin and you're so aware of how far short you fall of God's glory. But I see you as you're confessing and as you're calling sin what it is and as you're asking for repentance. And though your tendency is to fall into this karma-like rut, I see you seeking to believe the gospel. God's healing your heart. Keep believing in him. And I see you parents as you try to wrestle through how to make sense of a child that you raised to love Jesus but doesn't seem to be loving Jesus today, I see you as you're seeking to reject karma and believe in Jesus. Know this, parents. Your kids are not saved because of your parenting formula. The only hope of salvation for your kids is Jesus Christ. He alone saves. It's not your responsibility. So release control to God. I see God healing you. Believe the gospel. I join you in praying for your child that they would know Christ. May Christ continue to heal you as you work through this gospel reality. Finally, I'm looking at you folks who are, you've listened. You have not made Christ your savior. For those of you who are lost, if you've listened closely, you know that God's wrath against you has not been satisfied. His justice has not been met. But he can heal you today and he can save you. All you have to do is ask Christ to heal you. You repent of your sins, you trust in him, and he saves you. And this is, of course, what makes Christianity different than other, every other world religion. Hindus don't have this to offer you. Buddhists don't have this to offer you. Judaism doesn't have this to offer you. Muslims can't offer you this. Catholicism can't offer you this. Here's the message of the gospel. It's not about what you do. It's about what he did. And if you trust in him, he will save you. I pray you'd find healing. I pray God would heal us all. Let's believe in his power to heal. Will you pray with me? Now, Lord, I thank you for the text that you've given us. Thank you for the technology you've provided so we can communicate this message. I pray, Spirit, you would take these words and you would grow us to be more like Christ. Save those who don't know you. Bring joy to those who do and take the glory and credit for it all. In Jesus' name, amen.
it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only you give life you are love you bring for the Lord's benediction. 1 John 4, 10. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Friends, know that God's love for you has been satisfied by Jesus and go in that confidence to share the love of Jesus with the world. Amen, go in peace. Thank you again for joining us. We're so glad that you chose to worship with us. If you haven't already, please share this 
through social media. In the spirit of sharing, also share your resources, your time, your love with your family, your friends, your neighbors, your blessed friends in safe ways as we ride out this crisis together. If you'd like more information from Mill Creek, if you'd like to be part of our online newsletter, please send an email to communications at mymillcreek.com. That'll be the primary way we try to get information to you. As always, we depend on your generous giving to continue the mission of Mill Creek Community Church. We'd be so grateful if you'd be willing to navigate over to our website, mymillcreek.com, and click the giving link. We would be so grateful for your donations in this season. Well, thank you again for joining us, and until next time, have a great day.